the scripture reading this morning will be from 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 31, and it's entitled Unity and Diversity in the Body. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all is all is many parts from one body. So it was Christ. But we are all baptized by one spirit so far as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. We were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, one part but many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not be for that reason. Stop being, stop being part of the body. The whole body, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the bodies, the body, the place, the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker or indispensable and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our present parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So that there are so that there should be no division in the body, but the parts in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with that. Now you are in the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles. Do have the gifts of healing. Do all speak in tongues. Do interpret. Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. This is the word. I, I was going to do it in my James or John voice. <laughs> this, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Rod. That's a long scripture. And it picks up right where we left off last week. Uh, for those of you who didn't make it last week, you know, there's a the sermon on fake on uh, our website, or you can go to Facebook Live and see the whole kit and caboodle. So uh, how many of you had a chance to look at the spiritual gifts inventory that we talked about last week? Okay, a few of you. And right from the voice of God, right here out of the phone, encouragement. If you haven't had a chance to do this yet, you can find a link. If you go to our website, go under ministries, and uh, there is a link called Spiritual Gifts Assessment. And then it's also on our Facebook page, or you can just Google UMC Spiritual Gifts Assessment. And the idea is to take a little inventory of what are the spiritual gifts that you have and how they might be used for the kingdom of God and for what God is calling us to do here in Haiti. So 1 Corinthians lists some of the specific gifts. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, 
distinguishing between spirits, speaking in tongues, and then interpretation of tongues. There are more additional gifts listed in Romans. We talked about that last week. But these gifts are given through the Holy Spirit for the benefit of the community, which then benefits the world. We're still in Corinth, in the book of Corinthians that Paul wrote somewhere around 54 AD during his second missionary journey. <coughs> Corinth was a, but, uh, a bustling uh, port city. People from all over the region, very diverse. It was also uh, the home of the Temple of Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love. And the city and the temple area was crowded with thousands of prostitutes. And Corinth became known as a city of deviant and strange sexual behavior. But Corinth was a good place for Paul to be preaching from for the spread of the gospel. You had all these people coming together because of the ships, and then they would go out from there carrying the gospel message with them on their journey to foreign ports. Specifically, we're in 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul is talking about spiritual gifts in the body of believers and how all these work together. In our text today, Paul continues to make this connection between individual spiritual gifts and our collective behavior as the body of Christ. He brings up the rite of baptism, that we are all baptized into the body of Christ by the same Lord Jesus. It was just a few weeks ago when our baptismal font set right here and we had our service of remembering our baptism. And if you missed that, or if you haven't been baptized, please uh, reach out to me and we'll take care of your needs. Then Paul addresses our natural tendency to divide or to notice differences amongst one another in situations. Matter of fact, have you ever noticed that most of us, when confronted with something new, at least verbally, will begin to sort by what is different? Now, that's not true across the board. Psychological tests can help us figure out, do we sort by what is the same or what is different? But verbally, when I listen to a crowded discussion, often it is, well, that's different in this way, or that's not like this, or it's not like that. It's not what we've done before. I think of that as a form of human nature, that there is the nature we're born with and we act upon, and then there's the nature that God is calling us to be, and that would be one area where God is calling us to maybe look at things a little bit differently. He's, Paul speaks specifically to the differences when he says, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. Well, that's not so. Just because the hand is different from other parts of the body, it is still a part of the whole body. In fact, the whole body would not be the same without all the different parts. Then in verse 27, Paul writes something very clearly, saying, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. We are collectively the body of Christ. All of us together. We're one body in need of one another. And if we were to be better individually and as a group to accomplish what God is calling us to do and to be, then we must work together. Thus, it is good and a good and godly thing to be needy, which is the topic of our sermon today. It is good to be needy. In the last section of our scripture today, verses 28 to 31, Paul details the examples of how the spiritual gifts of each individual must work together, just like the human body must work together. He lists some of the roles that we serve in church. Apostles, prophets, teachers, miracle workers, healers, guides, and those with tongues. How would the church function if we all had the same role? If all were apostles, or all prophets, or all teachers? Imagine this room would be flipped. You would all be teaching and no one would be sitting here. It would be a little awkward. I mean, who would fill the other functions in the church? Who would be the greeter? 
Who would plan and work in outreach? Who would sing or play instruments? How do we function as a church with all people serving the same role? Well, we wouldn't. We can even see sometimes how difficult it is to function effectively when we're not working together or we're missing those with certain gifts. Again, Paul is very clear. We are all needed. We all have a place. Each of us is of value and has something to offer to all of us. And without all of us, we are incomplete. Now, we could do a little exercise to help make the point of this. I wonder if we were to take our spiritual gifts and put it like where our name tag is, one of our spiritual gifts. Then we could pick a topic, an issue facing our community, and begin to see how, based on our spiritual gifts, we might address the needs of hateful. We could identify which gifts people have that could pair up and work together to solve issues. I mean, wonder if we did this maybe as an exercise in one of our small groups or Sunday school class or around the table at lunch or maybe at the next church council meeting. <coughs> you know, what would it be like if we had our spiritual gift plastered on our forehead? Healer! Or whatever gift we have. What if we did this in our family gathering or our workplace or other groups we're part of? It would be just a different approach to how we address issues and opportunities. So what might it be like to address life's issues collectively based on spiritual gifts? Too often, we, we revert to our, our experience, our personal experience. You know, we humans tend to look at what has worked before, it'll probably work again. It, it reasons very well. Have you ever heard the phrase, don't reinvent the wheel? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd ask you, when would it make sense to reinvent the wheel? Let's look at a few examples. These are from our recent history. One example is taxi cabs versus shared ride services. For many years, taxi cabs were the accepted model of transportation. They're available at airports and train stations. You could call one to pick you up at your home and they were pretty reliable. But then came the idea of Uber and Lyft, the shared ride service. And they brought a new way of ordering a ride through a mobile app, of paying for the ride, of knowing what the cost of the ride would be before you got into the car. It allowed for quick payments through your mobile app. The driver gets paid faster also. You have the ability to rate the driver. The driver has the ability to rate you. So there's this feedback loop and accountability. You can carpool with someone you don't know. You can even carpool with people you do know and split the ticket up amongst all of you. So with this different approach, without the same requirement to own cars, to have the same kind of setup, Uber and Lyft have changed the face of the taxicab business forever. Now, the new approach and methods come with new challenges of security and licensing and how do local authorities have control. But the expectations amongst both drivers and the riding public has changed forever. Here's another example. Brick and mortar retailer versus online. I mean, how many, how many of you remember the Sears and Roebuck Wish Book Catalog? Yeah. I thought that someone might remember that. You know, each fall, the catalog was produced and sent out to homes to encourage the parents and children to do a little shopping and either mail order what you needed or go into a local Sears store to make the purchase. One year, I must have been in elementary school, I noticed my mom was going through the wish book and making little check marks on something that me, my sister, or my brother might need. So I found her red teacher's pen she was using <laughs> and went through and checked a few extra ones. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> so Richard Sears began selling watches and jewelry via, via mail order in 1888. 
And then due to changes in retail trends, Sears stopped producing the catalog in 1993 and opted for the developing online model of shopping. But today, Sears is on the verge of closing for good. Yeah. In December this past year, they announced the closing of 80 stores <clears throat> by next month, March. And there's new stories abound that say the entire chain may be sold or closed. I mean, how can this be? Sears was once the place to go where America shops. Well, Amazon and similar online options have increased in prominence so that Sears and others cannot compete in this re changing retail environment. Most brick and mortar retailers were slow to integrate the online and the in-store shopping experience. I remember ordering something from a retail store online and they're like, you can't return it to the store. Now you can now, but in the early, you know, so there were these problems that Amazon worked out. I mean, with Amazon Prime, you get free delivery often the next day in major markets and they have great return policies. I recently heard the story of a 30 something year old woman who has three kids at home and she does most of her shopping online. This is her mother telling the story. For an example, when she needs to order an out or get a new outfit for a special event, she'll order five different outfits, have them all sent to the home, try them all on at home, pick one and send the other four back. And the retailers are okay with that. They, a lot of them don't have brick and mortar. That came from work. So there's a different trend and a different buying process going on. And I'm not advocating for either one. I'm just pointing out how change in the retail model, in technology, and social trends have changed the face of retail forever. I mean, as you travel around the area, suburban and urban, you can see stores and malls in decline, disrepair, or closing. One more example, and this one's from the Bible, the Old and the New Testament. For many, many years, the Old Testament was the standard, the source of wisdom for at least the Jewish people, if not other people. Then Christ came and ushered in a new era of love and grace. There was a shift from a law-based interpretation of our relationship with God to a new orientation based upon grace and love. And this is illustrated in, in two verses. There's several of them, but I picked two to help speak to this. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then in Matthew 22, when Jesus was asked, Well, then what are the greatest commandments? He responded, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is much like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws and the prophets hang on these two commandments. With the New Testament, we believers are to emphasize the love of God and the love of others above all other commandments. The concept of love and grace and forgiveness should permeate our very soul in the relationship with others. But it doesn't always do that. We're human. You know why these are very true statements like, well, you shouldn't argue. Well, the church ought to do this. Well, we're in church. It ought to be different. Unfortunately, we're not always different. We're the same people from out in the world. We just happen to come together to try to make a difference and to try to be different, to try to be more Christ-like. But we should not be surprised when we in the church behave like those in the world because we're pretty much the same. The difference is we have a desire to be more Christ-like and we have opportunities or activities to help us do that whether that be through worship experience, Bible study, singing together, praying, spiritual retreats, leadership education, meditation, and other spiritual formation activities. So when does it make sense to reinvent the wheel? When conditions and trends change. This is why we find ourselves and other churches taking a look at how we do church. The underlying message of church 
And the purpose of church is needed as much now as it ever has. That's not change. But how we, the church, present the gospel, the good news, and how we engage with people is very different. And this is not new. Humans have been reinventing worship since the beginning of time. We don't worship fire in the way we used to. We don't worship even Christianity in the same patterns and way. The message is the same. God sent his only son to die for us on the cross. That even though we were sinners, we are forgiven. That's the same, but how we engage with people is a little different. So in order to adapt to our current time, it will take all of us with all of our spiritual gift. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. We are called to be together and work together for the kingdom of God. So as I reflected on the scripture, I came up with three different specific ways that we might carry out Paul's teachings from 1 Corinthians. The first one would be disagreement is not bad. It's actually a part of the process. In our scripture, <coughs> Paul talks about how the church in Corinth and we need to get together, honor our differences, but don't let it divide us. The scripture doesn't say, and you shall come together, all differences will fade away, and you will be of one mind and spirit, and there will be no dissension among you. It doesn't say that. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. How did y'all get along? We walked in a church building. What happened? We don't know, but we all left our disagreement outside. <laughs> it's not like that's a part of the process. I think part of the process is because God wants us working with each other and with God. I know I can't get along with all of you without God's help. I pray that almost every night. God, help me get along with these people. <laughs> God has created us in God's image, giving us spiritual gifts and now, God calls us to work together. When we engage with each other, we need to seek first to understand before being understood. This means a fundamental shift in our thinking. Instead of thinking, well, what am I going to say next? We need to listen and listen to understand. Maybe even asking clarifying questions. So, if I understand what you're saying... You said this and this. Did I get that right? And they may say, close. What I said or meant was this. And then you go, this? And they go, yeah. Now I understand. And now we can have some dialogue with some mutual respect. Number two, understand the vision God has before us. What we are becoming, what are we called to do in the community? And use that as the number one criteria in evaluating things and actions and activities. Seek to understand what God is calling on this church to be collectively. We might identify these things we want to do and be the same. And then other things we're going to approach things a little differently. For example, hopefully this is an easy one and won't erupt into a riot. If we were to discuss, should we have wood floors in here or should we have carpet? What I sense God saying is that we would be serving God to consider what God is calling us to do and to be. How are we reaching the others and consider the impact it will have on them before considering the impact it will have on ourselves? So we might ask, well, what is driving current church design and why? And how might those trends relate to us in our church? You know, too often we go back to our experience and go, well, I like carpet or oh, hardwoods are beautiful. Those are true and those are okay. But instead we may need to say, what are those people most likely to find less abrasive, easier to identify with, more welcoming, more loving, things of that nature. So I recall a time though when my mom and dad were talking about hardwood floors. And my dad said something like this. He said, I remember when wood floors were all we had. And we wish we had carpet. 
Why would we want to go back to wood floors? For him, it had a sense of accomplishment at this stage of his life. He could afford wall-to-wall -wall carpet. Why would he go back to a time when he didn't have the means and it was after the Depression and only certain people had wall-to-wall -wall carpet and air conditioning and, you know, color TV. So that makes sense in a home situation to create what's right for you and comfortable. But when it comes to a collective gathering, we really need to kind of set our own personal preferences aside and at least ask, what is right for the kingdom of God and for the people that are out there that God is calling us to minister to, the unchurched? Number three is to pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. When I first think of this, well, first of all, I think of the scripture that says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Then I think, about the monks or some form of people who have dedicated their life separated from the world and living in certain conditions and in ways. So they may live in a communal space, dividing up the duties of the day and the tasks for making a living. If they're selling bread as a way for earn a living for their place, then they all divide the duties of making the bread. They may get together five times a day to pray. They may sing prayerful songs while they work. They may memorize sections of scripture and repeat it like a mantra as they go about their daily duties. Now, while this is one way or approach to praying without ceasing, I don't think it's the only way. I mean, we may not live in the same type of circumstances as a monk and be able to do that. Yet, we can dedicate our work and our activities to God so that everything we do we do to the glory of God. We too can memorize some scripture to say during the day. We can set our phone with a reminder chime so a few times a day we stop, give thanks to God, maybe say a prayer. We can commune with other believers in the workplace or through social media, a phone call, or to getting together with a cup of, or a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. We can live a life dedicated to Christ in a secular world. Each one of us has been given spiritual gifts, talents, skills, resources, and more. And God wants us to use those collectively to build the kingdom of God. God is asking us to find ways to get along with one another, to use those differences to our advantage and to the advantage of building a, a new kingdom of God on earth. And God is asking us to be in an intentional relationship with God and with others. Now, all of this is not possible when we don't have God in our life, but all of it is possible with God in our life. I pray that something in the sermon has moved you in a way to draw nearer to God today and each day. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If you have been moved by a song, word, sermon, or community engagement today and would like to commit your life to Christ or to join this church, please come forward during our last hymn. Or if you'd like, we can meet in the foyer afterwards to talk about that. And I'll let us sing our closing hymn, Testify to Love. And to help us do that, we're going to invite a, a newer member of the community, Mr. Donald Roby, up to play a little drum. Come on, Donald! Help us for some. Bring us home. She's all yours. All right. <laughs> all right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.